Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The book, The Evolution of an Empire, a brief historical sketch of France by Mary Platt Parmeli, provides a concise overview of the major events and trends that have shaped the history of France. The book begins by exploring the ancient Celtic tribes and their conquest by Julius Caesar during the Roman Empire's expansion. The book then delves into the Germanic invasion of France in the 5th century C, which led to the establishment of the Merovingian dynasty. The book also covers the rise of the Carolingian dynasty, which marked a period of significant cultural and economic development in France. The book discusses the impact of the Crusades and the Hundred Years' War on France's political and social landscape, as well as the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, which brought significant cultural and intellectual advancements to the country. Additionally, the book explores the French Revolution and its aftermath, including Napoleon Bonaparte's rise to power and the subsequent restoration of the monarchy. The book concludes with a discussion of the Industrial Revolution and France's role in World War I. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend you both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 1 One of the greatest achievements of modern research is the discovery of a key by which we may determine the kinship of nations. What we used to conjecture, we now know. An identity in the structural form of language establishes with scientific certitude that however diverse their character and civilizations, Russian, German, English, French, Spaniard, are all but branches from the same parent stem are all alike children of the Asiatic Aryan. So skillful are modern methods of questioning the past and so determined the effort to find out its secrets, we may yet know the origin and history of this wonderful Asiatic people and when and why they left their native continent and colonized upon the northern shores of the Mediterranean. Certain it is, however, that more centuries before the Christian era than there have been since, they had peopled Western Europe. This branch of the Aryan family is known as the Celtic and was older brother to the Teuton and Slav, which at a much later period followed them from the ancestral home and appropriated the middle and eastern portions of the European continent. The name of Gaul was given to the territory lying between the ocean and the Mediterranean and the Pyrenees and the Alps. And at a later period a portion of northern Gaul and the islands lying north of it received from an invading chieftain and his tribe the name Brit or Britain or Pryd or Prydane. If the mind could be carried back on the track of time and we could see what we now call France as it existed 20 centuries before the Christian era, we should behold the same natural features the same mountains rearing their heads, the same rivers flowing to the sea, the same plains stretching out in the sunlight. But instead of vines and flowers and cultivated fields we should behold great herds of wild ox and elk and of swine as fierce as wolves, ranging in a climate as cold as Norway, and vast inaccessible forests, the home of beasts of prey, which contended with men for food and shelter. Let us read Giso's description of life in Gaul five centuries before Christ. Here lived six or seven millions of men a bestial life, in dwellings dark and low, built of wood and clay and covered with branches or straw, 
opened to daylight by the door alone and confusedly heaped together behind a rampart of timber, earth, and stone, which enclosed and protected what they were pleased to call a town. Such was the Paris, and such the Frenchmen of the age of Pericles. And the same tides that washed the sands of southern Gaul, a few hours later ebbed and flowed upon the shores of Greece rich in culture, with refinements and subtleties in art which are the despair of the world today with an intellectual endowment never since attained by any people. The same sun which rose upon temples and palaces and life serene and beautiful in Greece, an hour later lighted sacrificial altars and hideous orgies in the forests of Gaul. While the Gaul was nailing the heads of human victims to his door, or hanging them from the bridle of his horse, or burning or flogging his prisoners to death, the Greek, with a literature, an art, and a civilization in ripest perfection, discussed with his friends the deepest problems of life and destiny, which were then baffling human intelligence, even as they are with us today. Truly we of Celtic and Teuton descent are latecomers upon the stage of national life. There was no promise of greatness in ancient Gaul. It was a great unregulated force rushing hither and thither. Impelled by insatiate greed for the possessions of their neighbors, there was no permanence in their loves or their hatreds. The enemies of today were the allies of tomorrow. Guided entirely by the fleeting desires and passions of the moment, with no far-reaching plans to restrain, the sixty or more tribes composing the Gallic people were in perpetual state of feud and anarchy, apparently insensible to the ties of brotherhood which give concert of action and stability in form of national life. If they overran a neighboring country, it seemed not so much for permanent acquisition as to make it a camping ground until its resources were exhausted. We read of one Massilia who came with a colony of Greeks long ages ago, and after founding the city of Marseilles, created a narrow bright border of Greek civilization along the southern edge of the benighted land. It was a brief illumination, lasting only a century or more and leaving few traces, but it may account for the superior intellectual quality of the southern provinces in future France. It requires a vast extent of territory to sustain a people living by the chase and upon herds and flocks, hence the area which now amply maintains 35 millions of Frenchmen was all too small for 6 or 7 million Gauls, and they were in perpetual struggle with their neighbors for land more land. Give us land, they said to the Romans, and when land was denied them and the gates of cities disdainfully closed upon their messengers, not land, but vengeance, was their cry and hordes of half-naked barbarians trampled down the vineyards and rushed a tumultuous torrent upon Rome. The Romans could not stand before this new and strange kind of warfare. The Gauls streamed over the vanquished legions into the eternal city, silent and deserted save only by the Senate and a few who remained entrenched in the citadel, and there the barbarians kept them besieged for seven months while they made themselves at home amid uncomprehended luxuries. Of course, Roman skill and courage at last dislodged and drove them back. But the fact remained that the Gaul had been there, master of Rome, that the iron-clad legions had been no match for his naked force, and a new sensation thrilled through the length and breadth of Gaul. It was the first throb of national life. The sixty or more fragments drew closer together into something like Gallic unity with a common danger to meet, a common foe to drive back. Hereafter there was another hunger to be appeased besides that for food and land, a hunger for conquest, for vengeance, and for glory for the Gallic name. National pride was born. For years they hovered like wolves about Rome. But skill and superior intelligence tell in the centuries. It took long and cost no end of blood and treasure, but 200 years from the capture of Rome, 
the Gauls were driven out of Italy, and the Alps pronounced a barrier set by nature herself against barbarian encroachments. Italy was not the only country suffering from the destroying footsteps of the Western Celts. There had been long ago an overflow of a tribe in northern Gaul, the Kymrians, which had hewed and plundered its way south and eastward until at the time of Alexander, 340 BC, it was knocking at the gates of Macedonia. Stimulated by the success at Rome 50 years earlier, they were, with fresh insolence, demanding land, and during the centuries which followed, the Gallic name acquired no fresh luster in Greece. Half-naked, gross, ferocious and ignorant, sometimes allies, but always a scourge, they finally crossed the Hellespont, 278 BC, and turned their attention to Asia Minor. And there, at last, we find them settled in a province called Galicia, where they lived without amalgamating with the people about them, it is said, even as late as 400 years after Christ, speaking the language of their tribal home, what is now Belgium. And these were the Galatians, the foolish Galatians, to whom Paul addressed his epistle, and we have followed up this Gallic thread simply because it mingles with the larger strand of ancient and sacred history with which we are all so familiar. It is not strange that Roman courage and endurance became a byword. Her fiber was toughened by perpetual strain of conflict. Even while she was struggling with Gaul and while the echoes of the Hunnish invasion were still resounding through the continent, Hannibal, with his hosts, was pouring through Gaul and gathering accessions from that people as he swept down into Italy. Then, with the memories of the Carthaginian wars still fresh at Rome, the Goths were at her gates, their blows directed with a solidity superior to that of the barbarians who had preceded them. Where the Gauls had knocked, the Goths thundered. Again the city was invaded by barbarian feet, and again did superior training and intelligence drive back the invading torrent and triumph over native brute force. Such, in brief outline, was the condition of the centuries just before the Christian era. Chapter 2 the making of a nation is not unlike bread or cake making. One element is used as the basis to which are added other component parts of varying qualities and the result we call England or Germany or France. The steps by which it is accomplished, the blending and fusing of the elements require centuries and the process makes what we call history. It was written in the Book of Fate that Gaul should become a great nation, but not until fused and interpenetrated with two other nationalities. She must first be humanized and civilized by the Roman, and then energized and made free from the Roman by the Teuton. The instrument chosen for the former was Julius Caesar, and for the latter five centuries later Clovis, the Frankish leader. It is safe to affirm that no man has ever so changed the course of human events as did Julius Caesar. Napoleon, who strove to imitate him 1800 years later, was a charlatan in comparison, a mere scene shifter on a great theatrical stage. Not a trace of his work remains upon humanity today. Caesar opened up a pathway for the old civilizations of the world to flow into Western Europe and the sodden mass of barbarism was infused with a life-compelling current. This was not accomplished by placing before the inferior race a higher ideal of life for imitation, but by a mingling of the blood of the nations a transfusion into Gallic veins of the germs of a higher living and thinking thus making them heirs to the great civilizations of antiquity. No human event was ever fraught with such consequences to the human race as the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar. The Gallic Wars had for centuries drained the treasure and taxed the resources of Rome. Caesar conceived the audacious idea of stopping them at their source in fact of making Gaul a Roman province. 
It was a marvelous exhibition, not simply of force, but of force wielded by supreme intelligence and craft. He had lived for years among this people and knew their sources of weakness, their internal jealousies and rivalries, their incohesiveness. When they hurled themselves against Rome, it was as a mass of sharp fragments. When the Goths did the same, it was as one solid, indivisible body. Caesar saw that by adroit management he could disintegrate this people even while conquering them. By forcibly maintaining in power those who submitted to him, being by turns gentle and severe, ingratiating here, terrifying there, he established a tremendous personal force and during nine years carried on eight campaigns, marvels in the art of war, as well as in the subtler methods of negotiation and intrigue. He had successively dealt with all the Gallic tribes, even including Great Britain, subjugating either through their own rivalries or by his invincible arm. Equally able to charm and to terrify, he had all the gifts, all the means to success and empire that can be possessed by man. Great in politics as in war, as full of resource in the forum as on the battlefield, he was by nature called to dominion. It was not as a patriot, simply intent upon freeing Rome of an harassing enemy, that he endured those nine years in Gaulnot as a great leader burning with military ardor that he conducted those eight campaigns. The conquest of Gaul meant the greater conquest of Rome. The one was accomplished, he now turned his back upon the devastated country and prepared to complete his great project of human ascendancy. Rome was mistress of the world, he would be master of Rome. Chapter 3 While the star of empire was thus moving toward the west, another and brighter star was about to arise in the east. So accustomed are we to this story that we lose all sense of wonder at its recital. Julius Caesar's brief triumph was over. Mark Antony had recited his virtues over his beer, Rome had wept, and then forgotten him in the absorbing splendors of his nephew Augustus. In an obscure village of an obscure country in Asia Minor, the young wife of a peasant finds shelter in a stable and gives birth to a son who is cradled in the straw of a manger from which the cattle are feeding. Can the mind conceive of human circumstances more lowly? The child grew to manhood and in his 33 years of life was never lifted above the obscure sphere into which he was born, never spoke from the vantage ground of worldly elevation, simply moving among people of his own station in life, mechanics, fishermen, and peasants, he told of a religion of love, a gospel of peace, for which he was willing to die. Who would have dreamed that this was the germ of the most potent, the most regenerative force the world had ever known? That thrones, empires, principalities, and powers would melt and crumble before his name? Of all miracles, is not this the greatest? The passionate ardor with which this religion was propagated in the first two centuries had no motive but the yearning to make others share in its benefits and hopes, and to this end to accept the belief that Jesus Christ had come in fulfillment of a long-promised Savior who should be sent to this world clothed with divine authority to establish a spiritual kingdom in which he was King of Kings, Lord of Lords, mediator between us and the Father of whom he was the only begotten Son. The religion in its essence was absolutely simple. Its founder summed it up in two sentences, expressing the duty of man to man and of man to God. That was all the theology he formulated. For two centuries, the religion of Christ was an elementary spiritual force. It appealed only to the highest attributes and longings of the human soul and under its sustaining influence frail women, men, 
and even children were able to endure tortures of which we cannot read even now without shuddering horror. Nature's method of gardening is very beautiful. She carefully guards the seed until it is ripe, then she bursts the imprisoning walls and gives it to the winds to distribute. Precisely such method was used in disseminating Christianity. It was not for one people, it was for the healing of the nations, and its home was wherever man abides. Nearly five decades after Christ's death upon the cross, Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus. The home of Christianity was effaced. At just the right moment, the enclosing walls had broken and freed to the winds the germs in all their primitive purity. Imperial favor had not tarnished it, human ambitions had not employed and degraded it, nor had it been made into complex system by ingenious casuists. The pure spiritual truth, unsullied as it came from the hand of its founder, was scattered broadcast as the band of Christians dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, naturally forming into communities here and there, which became the centers of Christian propagandism. Lions in Gaul was such a center. The fires of persecution had been lighted here and there throughout the empire and the Emperor Nero, under whom the apostles Peter and Paul are said to have suffered martyrdom, had amused himself by making torches of the Christians at Rome. But until 177 AD Gaul was exempt from such horrors. Marcus Aurelius, that peerless pagan, large in intelligence, exalted in character, and guided by a conscientious rectitude which has made his name shine like a star in the lurid light of Roman history, still failed utterly to comprehend the significance of this spiritual kingdom established by Christ on earth. He it was who ordered the first persecution in Gaul. In pursuance of his command, Horrible tortures were inflicted at lions upon those who would not abjure the new faith. A letter written by an eyewitness pictures with terrible vividness the scenes which followed. Many cases are described with harrowing detail and of one Blandina it is said, from morn till eve they put her to all manner of torture, marveling that she still lived with her body pierced through and through and torn piecemeal by so many tortures of which a single one should have sufficed to kill her, to which she only replied, I am a Christian. The recital goes on to tell how she was then cast into a dungeon, her feet compressed and dragged out to the utmost tension of the muscles, then left alone in darkness until new methods of torture could be devised. Finally she was brought with other Christians into the amphitheater, hanging from a cross to which she was tied and there thrown to the beasts. As the beasts refused to touch her, she was taken back to the dungeon to be reserved for another occasion, being brought out daily to witness the fate and suffering of her friends and fellow martyrs, still answering the oft-repeated question, dash, I am a Christian. The writer goes on to say, after she had undergone fire, the talons of beasts, and every agony which could be thought of, she was wrapped in a network and thrown to a bull, who tossed her in the air and her sufferings were ended. Truly it cost something to say I am a Christian in those days. Marcus Aurelius probably gave orders for the persecution at Lyons, with little knowledge of what would be the nature of those persecutions or of the religion he was trying to exterminate. Some of the hours spent in writing introspective essays would have been well employed in studying the period in which he lived and the empire he ruled. Paganism and Druidism, those twin monsters, receded before the advancing light of Christianity. Neither contained anything which could nourish the soul of man and both had become simply badges of nationality. Druidism was the last stronghold of independent Gallic life. It was a mixture of northern myth and oriental dreams of metempsychosis, coarse, mystical, and cruel. 
The Roman paganism, which was superimposed by the conquering race, was the mere shell of a once vital religion. Educated men had long ceased to believe in the gods and divinities of Greece, and it is said that the Roman augurs, while giving their solemn prophetic utterances, could not look at each other without laughing. In the year 312, alas for Christianity, it was espoused by imperial power. When the Emperor Constantine declared himself a Christian, there was no doubt rejoicing among the saints, but it was the beginning of the degeneracy of the religion of Christ. The faith of the humble was to be raised to a throne, its lowly garb to be exchanged for purple and scarlet, the gospel of peace to be enforced by the sword. The empire was crumbling, and upon its ruins the race of the future and social conditions of modern times were forming. Paganism and Druidism would have been an impossibility. Christianity, even with its luster dimmed, its purity tarnished, its simplicity overlaid with scholasticism, was better than these. The miracle had been accomplished. The great Roman Empire had said, I am Christian. Chapter 4 Gaul had been Latinized and Christianized. Now one more thing was needed to prepare her for a great future. Her fiber was to be toughened by the infusion of a stronger race. Julius Caesar had shaken her into submission and Rome had chastised her into decency of behavior and speech, but as her manners improved her native vigor declined. She took kindly to Roman luxury and effeminacy and could no longer have thundered at the gates of her neighbors demanding land. But at last the great Roman Empire was dying and even degenerate Gaul was struggling out of her relaxing grasp. In her extremity she called upon the Franks, a powerful Germanic race, to aid her. This people had long looked with covetous eyes at the fair fields stretching beyond the Rhine and lost no time in accepting the invitation. They overspread the land and Gaul and Roman alike were submerged beneath the Teuton flood while the Frankish conqueror, Clovis, son of the great Maravos, was at Paris or Lutetia wearing the kingly crown. Such was the beginning of independent and of dynastic life in France. Rome had found a more powerful ally than she hoped and the desire of Gaul was accomplished in that she was free from Rome. But the king of whom she had dreamed was of her own race, not this terrible Frank. Had she exchanged one servitude for another? Had she been, not set free, but simply annexed to the realm of the barbarian across the Rhine? Let us say rather that it was an espousal. She had brought her dowry of beauty and land, that most coveted of possessions, and had pledged obedience, for which she was to be cherished, honored, and protected, and to bear the name of her lord. Ancient heroes are said to be seen through a shadowy lens, which magnifies their stature. Let us hope that the crimes of the three or four generations immediately succeeding Clovis have been in like manner expanded, for it is sickening to read of such monstrous prodigality of wickedness. Whole families butchered, husbands, wives, children, anything obstructing the path to the throne with an atrocity which makes Richard III seem a mere pygmy in the art of intrigue and killing. The chapter closes with the daughter and mother of kings, Brunhild or Brunhot, naked and tied by one arm, one leg and her hair to the tail of an unbroken horse, and amid jeers and shouts dashed over the stones of Paris, 680. But even the Frank succumbed to the enervating Gallic influence. The Merovingian line commenced by Clovis faded from ferocity into imbecility. Its kings in less than two centuries had become mere lay figures wearing the symbols of an authority which existed nowhere unless in the Mer du Palais. 
This office from being a sort of royal stewardship had grown to be the governing power de facto. While Theodoric, the Phantom King, was having his long locks dressed and perfumed, his mare du Palais, Charles, was molding and welding his kingdom and at the same time staying the Mohammedan flood which was pouring over the Pyrenees and, by his final and decisive blow in defense of the Christianity espoused by Clovis, earning the name Charles Martel, the Hammer. Less than 100 years after the death of Clovis, there had come out of Asia, that birthplace of religions, a new faith, which was destined to be for centuries the scourge of Christendom and which today rules one-third of the human family. Zoroaster, Buddha, Christ, had successively come with saving message to humanity and now, 600 AD, Muhammad believed himself divinely appointed to drive out of Arabia the idolatry of ancient Magianism, the religion of Zoroaster. Christianity had passed through strange vicissitudes. Kings, emperors, popes, and bishops had been terrible custodians of its truths, and while many still held it in its primitive purity, ecclesiastics were fiercely fighting over the nature of the Trinity, the divinity of the Virgin Mother, and the Church was shaken to its foundation by furious factions. In this hour of weakness, the Persians, 590 AD, had conquered Asia Minor. Bethlehem, Gethsemane, and Calvary were profaned, the Holy Sepulchre had been burned, and the cross carried off amid shouts of laughter. Magianism had insulted Christianity, and no miracle had interposed. The heavens did not roll asunder, nor did the earth open her abysses to swallow them up. There was consternation and doubt in Christendom. Such was the state of the church when Mohammedanism came into existence. There is but one God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Such was its battle cry and its creed, and the moral precepts of the Quran its gospel. There seems nothing in this to account for the mad enthusiasm and the passion for worship in its followers. But in less than a hundred years this lion out of Arabia had subjected Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Northern Africa, and the Spanish Peninsula. Now, sword in one hand and the Quran in the other, the Mohammedan had crossed the Pyrenees and was in southern Gaul. Under the strange magic of this faith, the largest religious empire the world had known had sprung into existence, stretching from the Chinese Wall to the Atlantic, from the Caspian to the Indian Ocean, and Jerusalem, the metropolis of Christianity Jerusalem, the Mecca of the Christian, was lost. The crescent floated over the birthplace of our Lord, and notwithstanding the temporary successes of the Crusades, it does to this day. If the Pyrenees were passed, the very existence of Christendom was threatened. Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, averted this danger when he stayed the infidel flood at the Battle of Tours, 732 AD. Pepin, the son of Charles Martel, who succeeded him as Mère du Palais, does not seem to have had the temper or spirit of an usurper but simply to have been an energetic, resolute man who was bored by the circumlocution of governing through a king who did not exist. He determined to put an end to the fiction and to cut the Gordian knot by first cutting the long curls of the last Merovingian, Childeric, and then putting the crown upon his own head, he sent the unfortunate phantom of royalty to a monastery to reflect upon the uncertainty of human pleasures and events. By right of manhood and superiority, the Carlovingian line had succeeded to the Merovingian. Against the dark background of European history and with the broad level of obscurity stretching over the ages at its feet, there rises one shining pinnacle. Considered as man or sovereign, Charlemagne is one of the most impressive figures in history. His seven feet of stature clad in shining steel 
his masterful grasp of the forces of his time, his splendid intelligence, instinct even then with the modern spirit all combined to elevate him in solitary grandeur. Charlemagne found France in disorder measureless and apparently insurmountable. Barbarian invasion without and anarchy within, Saxon paganism pressing in upon the north and Asiatic Islamism upon the south and west, a host of forces struggling for dominion in a nation brutish, ignorant, and without cohesion. It is the attribute of genius to discern opportunity where others see nothing. Charlemagne saw rising out of this chaos a great resuscitated Roman Empire, which should be at the same time a spiritual and Christian empire as well. Saxons, Slavs, Huns, Lombards, Arabs came under his compelling grasp, these antagonistic races all held together by the force of one terrible will, an unnatural combination with France. No political liberties, no popular assemblies discussing public measures, it is Charlemagne alone who fills the picture, it is absolutism marked by prudence, ability, and grandeur, but still absolutism. The Pope looked approvingly upon this son of the church by whose order 4,500 pagan heads could be cut off in one day and a whole army compelled to baptism in an afternoon. Here was a champion to be propitiated. Charlemagne, on the other hand, saw in the church the most compliant and effective means to empire. In the loving alliance formed, he was to be the protector, the pope, the protected. He wore the church as a precious jewel in his crown. It was a splendid dream, splendidly realized, the most imposing of human successes and the most impressive of human failures. It seems designed as a lesson for the human race in the transitory nature of power applied from without. The vast fabric passed with himself was gone like a shadow when he was gone. The unity of the empire was buried in the grave of its founder. In 29 years, by the Treaty of Verdun, three kingdoms emerged from the crumbling mass. France, Italy, Germany, already separated by race repulsions, had taken up each a distinct national existence, the imperial crown remaining with Germany. And France, France, the center of this dream of unity, with her native incohesiveness and in the irony of fate, had broken into no less than 59 fragments loosely held together by one Carlovingian king.